Hi, everyone. This is John Daly. I'm here again with Bernie Goldberg for another episode of the No BS Zone. How's it going today, Bernie? As I always say, John, so far, so good. Great, great. So we're going to cover a number of topics today, beginning with the GOP presidential primary race, which we actually haven't talked about uh, in a few weeks. Uh, nationally, nationally, it doesn't seem that a whole lot has changed. The polls continue to show that most Republican voters want Donald Trump to be the party's nominee. He's still at over 50 percent, despite facing you know, additional criminal charges. Uh, there's been some discussion lately about whether or not the upcoming debates will make any difference at all in this race. Uh, Bernie, what do you think? Do you have reason to believe that the debates will matter? I do. I, I really do. I think they will matter. Most people are not like you or, or me or all the people listening to us. We're news junkies. We know who Vivek Ramanswani is. I don't think most Americans know who he is. I don't think most Americans know much about Tim Scott uh, or, or many of the others. And I think somebody, you know, Yogi, Yogi Berra said predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future, right? But here's a prediction. I think somebody's going to catch on. Now, the question is, are they going to catch on? Uh, to what extent? That I don't know. I'm not saying somebody's going to catch on and overtake Donald Trump, but I think somebody's going to say something and people at home who are just getting involved in, in the primary debates and, and the campaign are going to say, well, that, that person sounds interesting. Uh, I think Vivek Ramanswani is the leading contender for catching on. Uh, I think Tim Scott could catch on. Uh, I think it would help if Donald Trump took part because then they could see the contrast between the crude, vulgar, loudmouth, and the more reasonable, thoughtful candidates. But even if Donald Trump doesn't show up, I think, I think the debates to your question will matter. And I think somebody will be noticed and I think their their standings will go from three or four or five percent considerably higher. But but what I'm not saying is that they will now overtake Donald Trump. That that remains to be seen. You bring up a good point about um, you know not everybody is like us. They're not watching the news as closely as we are, um, especially you know during summertime. Um, it's uh, a lot of people are out there doing things. They're not spending a lot of time thinking about this stuff right now, and that that makes perfect sense. Uh, you brought up the point about whether or not um, Donald Trump will, will show up and that you think that would be a good thing. I, I do think that would be a good thing for, for voters. I'm not convinced it would be a good thing for Trump. Um, you know, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, no, 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 no. I, I, if I, I didn't mean to suggest that for a second. Oh. If, if you're ahead, and here, here's another example. He says he's like 70 points ahead. He's not 70 points ahead, but he's ahead. He's got nothing to gain. If I were advising Trump, I'd say, don't go. But you got to weigh that against his massive ego. And I don't know if he could resist going. But from a strictly strategic point of view, he's got more to lose than to gain by showing up. And I think that's, I think you're right. And I think that's, um, if if, he, if Trump announces that he's not showing up, and he's already sort of suggested that uh, he's recently Poo pooed the same, uh, you know, loyalty oath, GOP nominee loyalty oath that other people have have done that with, and it doesn't sound like he's really that interested in coming. Um, I, I do wonder if that's going to sort of uh, tamp down how many people are going to tune in. I mean, a lot of people were, would probably tune in if Trump appeared. I'm not as confident that many will if he won't. But um, what do you, what do you think about that? Totally agree. Totally agree. Trump, Trump is the draw, and if it's a bunch of politicians or would-be politicians on a stage, that's going to draw a much smaller audience. Yeah, and I think that, you know, regardless if he does show up or not, um, I do think if he doesn't show up, you know, people who do tune in will actually see, they could potentially see a serious policy debate. Um, I don't think that'll be the case if, if Trump shows up. I think there'll be, there'll be a lot of mudslinging. But I do think, regardless, the other candidates, I think they really need to focus on the electability argument. Um, as you recently pointed out, Bernie, 
there are actually some polls that show that Trump is very close to Biden. So right. um, all these people saying, you know, Trump's not electable. The polls say, well, you know, maybe he is electable. And um, but at the same time, I think they have to make the argument that in practice, um, Trump has been electorally toxic to the GOP for the last three election cycles. You know, he cost the party dearly. He lost them everything. And that was before um, he was brought up on a bunch of these criminal charges. That was before uh, some of it was before January 6th. But um, I do think to make the electability argument really stick, I think candidates, the ones that are actually trying to win, I don't think all of them are, I think they need to say in no uncertain terms that Trump did lose the last presidential election. Because if, if they can't make that, and some are, you know, Christie's speaking out strongly against this. DeSantis is, is, more, is doing more so than he was, same with Pence. But I don't think unless you really you get a unified message on that and a strong message on that. You're really not giving, you know, people who have stuck Trump with Trump this far. You're not really giving them a great reason to abandon him and go with you. Uh, what, do, what do you think about that? I think that's correct, but it's only half of the equation. The other half is, is it going to matter? I mean, you, you can could, you could find t- tons of people saying, I'm not sure Donald Trump is electable and I'm supporting Donald Trump. It's not rational. He lost the 2018 election in the House because people were tired of Donald Trump. They voted against Republicans in 2018. He lost the presidency in 2020. A couple of months later, he lost the Senate in the runoff election in Georgia. The midterms in 2022 were a disaster for Republicans thanks to Donald Trump's candidates, the ones he endorsed. You don't need any more proof than that to say this guy is not good for the Republican Party. And if electability is what you care about, then you can't want Donald Trump. Yet they want Donald Trump. So as somebody once said to me, you can't be rational with irrational people. No, that's a good point. And it's I think there was a point right after the midterms where that message was starting to break through a little bit. I think everybody sort of realized that, again, Trump had cost them another election. Not everybody was going to admit it or say it out loud. But, you know, in contrast, you had at the time, you know, Ron DeSantis, who was the closest competitor, he hadn't announced yet. I don't think anybody had announced yet at that point. But, um, you know, he is, you see all these these Trump uh, Senate candidates go down in flames. And in the, mean, in the meantime, you have against you, Trump. But, you know... Go ahead. You're, you're freezing up there, John. So say that again, please. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much made it through, but the, uh, I think right after the midterms, uh, Trump was probably at his weakest. I think everybody realized, and I'll, I'll edit this later, Bernie, if it's all botched up, but I think people realized uh, that he was, you know, again, he hurt them in the election. And um, DeSantis, on the other hand, had won Florida when he was running for governor for re-election by almost 20 points. And I, you know, you see the polls back then and DeSantis was was doing pretty well and uh, up against Trump, not not overcoming him or, or anything, but looking pretty good. But over time, yeah, I think just Trump being out there in the mix, doing what he does, the personality cult stuff, um, it really has come to his benefit while DeSantis um, has not talked as much about his electability, not as much about um, his strengths and kind of trying to double down on the culture wars and sort of out culture war Trump. And I think it's really uh, it's really only benefited Trump since then. Yeah, the Trump's indictments also in- increase his poll numbers. Let me, let me say one last thing before we move on. Trump has roughly 50 percent of the GOP primary support among G- GOP voters, 50 percent roughly. That means 50% don't want Trump. So the field is open to somebody, but if there are 200 Republican candidates versus Trump, Trump's gonna win. They've gotta winnow this field down quickly to, to preferably one other candidate or maybe two other candidates. But as long as it's Trump versus the field, uh, and the field is as large as it is. Uh, this is Trump's election to lose. Otherwise, he'll win. Otherwise, at least the primary, the the nomination. Uh, 
So one would hope if you don't want Trump to be the nominee, one would hope that the other candidates as good as they are, as decent as they are, as responsible as they are, they, they got to drop out. They got to drop out if they don't have support. No, I think that's true. And I'm, I'm hoping those who are serious candidates will when it's when it's clear that there's no uh, when there's no recourse there. So um, let's go ahead and switch gears. There was sort of an interesting sports story last week that had a political twist to it. The U.S. women's national soccer team lost to Sweden at the uh, Women's World Cup. Um, they were eliminated. And a lot of uh, right wing commentators and politicians and even some religious leaders like Franklin uh, Graham kind of uh, celebrated their defeat, you know, basically framing the loss as just desserts for the team's uh, politi years of political activism and wokeness and, and that sort of thing. Bernie, you've written a lot about the intersection of sports and politics. What do you think about this? The first thing I think is that you're going to disagree with every word I say from here going forward. Uh, Maybe not. Number one, number one, full disclosure, I'm not a soccer fan. Uh, there's not enough action around the goal. It doesn't interest me. But, I, you know, I followed what, what was going on. This particular women's soccer team was uh, pol had a bunch of political activists on the team. And they weren't afraid to speak out loud about their views. Uh, okay, they want to do that. That's up to them. Okay, but then don't expect the the. Don't be surprised by the reaction that you get when you turn a sporting team into a political activist group. Now, I did not root. Let me rephrase that. I did not actively root against the United States of America. I wouldn't do that. But when they lost, A, I wasn't saddened, and B, just between you and me and the many people listening to us, I smiled. It was a, <laughs> there was a bit, I admit this, there was a bit of happiness saying, you, the soccer team, brought this on yourself. You brought the reaction on yourself. You wanted to be woke. You wanted to be political. That's up to you. That's up to you. Nobody, I don't think anybody should stop you from doing that. But then when you lose, don't be shocked when people say, I'm glad you lost. No, see, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to surprise you. I, I mostly agree with what you're saying. Um, for me, I don't watch a lot of sports. I don't watch soccer. Uh, but when I do watch sports, I, I don't want to hear athletes, especially those representing our country, carrying on about political issues. Um, even if I happen to agree with what they're saying, uh, I'm the same way with musicians too. It just it sort of annoys me. And um, it's it's on the other hand, I think what what does sort of also annoy me is that how these issues are treated by, as a big deal by a lot of people, um, you know, many of whom I, I don't think should be taken all that seriously. I, I brought up Franklin Graham as an example. Um, that guy has excused far worse, far more consequential, you know, anti-American behavior than what was, was ever put forth by the U.S. women's soccer team. So when I see people like him carrying on about this stuff, I just kind of have to say, give me a break. But at the same time, I don't, I don't really have, just in general, I don't have a problem with the backlash that, that you know, the, the soccer team is getting from this. Well, you, you made a very important point that, that you just glided over, and that is this was a, became a bigger deal than it should have. Everything has become a bigger deal than it should have. Everything. I yeah. mean, Barbie has become a bigger deal than it should have. Barbie. Yeah. It's, a, it's a movie about... A, 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 a doll. So, so we are so polarized. We are so hypersensitive to every slight, real and perceived, that we jump on the opportunity to say the other side is wrong because the other side is always wrong. And guess what? The other side always thinks the other side is always wrong. I've said this before, but it's important enough. I'm going to say it again. People think that climate change is an existential threat. Maybe. I think polarization is an existential threat to the United States. We turn on each other. We don't like each other. There was a piece in the Atlantic recently that said 
Anybody who supports Donald Trump should be shunned by their family. Shunned by their family. So in other words, if your mother likes Donald Trump and she's 90 years old, you should have nothing to do with her. This is ridiculous, but that's where, that's where we are. And it's not a good place to be. No, and you're right. You bring up, you brought up Barbie. Um, someone brought that up in the Q and A. I think it was last week. Kind yeah, of saying, Tom, you know, the it, was very, it was a very intelligent point that he made. But, but, right. He was, he, but I thought it was funny. He was sort of pointing to that as a uh, sort of illustration of sort of the, the lack of intelligence um, in America today. I, I will, I will take issue with that. I was back when I was a kid. Um, the big movies were like the, the police academy movies, which are just ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's, but, dude, they they appeal to not to the intelligence of fans. There's a lot of, of dumb movies, so I guess I just I, I don't missed, have. I missed, I missed the word. What kind of movies did you say? Oh, uh, the police academy movies. Oh, police. <laughs> oh, listen, yeah. I'm not against I'm not against mindless movies. Zoolander <laughs> is one of the great mindless yeah. movies of all time, but. <laughs> But my point was that conservatives and liberals went head and head over Barbie. Right. Come on. Right. Can't anything just, can't we let anything just slide by and say, yeah, I disagree on that, but I'm not going to make a big deal out. No, every, you said this, John, you're the one who said it. Everything has become a big deal. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. And uh, this is just the latest one, the, the soccer team issue. Um, switching gears again, Bernie, you wrote a piece on Monday about uh, Suzanne Scott, where you asked the question, why hasn't she been fired? Um, can, she, she's the CEO of Fox. Can you do a, a quick recap of why you're wondering why she still has a job, sort of the, the bullet points from your column? Before I do, let me say something I did not say in the piece. I'm not a fan of any of the three major cable news operations because right. I'm, I'm not saying I'm a good journalist, but I'm a journalist, old school, even opinion people have to be fair. And, and I think these three are just business operations that pander to their particular audience. So I'm, I'm not a fan of any of them. I wrote about Fox because I, were, I was a contributor there for a long time and I know a little about Fox. Okay, that said, <clears throat> under Suzanne Scott's so-called leadership, Fox had to settle an $800 million lawsuit uh, to Dominion Voting Systems, presumably because Fox people were, Fox anchors and producers were putting out information that Dominion said to fame them, and that Fox people did not believe to be true, even as they were putting it out. Okay, they have another two billion dollar plus lawsuit pending by another uh, voting uh, firm. Okay, so that's one one they settled for eight hundred million. This other one is they're asking, I think, two point seven billion billion with a B. They settled a lawsuit recently with a former employee who said it was a hostile work environment. This was a woman a producer, and that cost Fox $12 million. They have several more lawsuits pending by shareholders. And there's another lawsuit by a man who says he was defamed by Tucker Carlson as a government operative on the January 6th riot to make uh, Donald Trump look bad. Most of this stems from people on Fox putting out information in defense of Donald Trump on January 6th. Suzanne Scott has told her people to quote, respect the audience. What does that mean? Tell them the truth? No, it means tell them what they want to hear so that they'll come back for more. Give them a lot of news about Tucker Carlson, which is legitimate. Play down what's happening to Donald Trump, the opposite of what happens at CNN. Every time you tune in CNN, it's about Donald Trump's problems and Tucker Carlson at best is an afterthought, at absolute best is an afterthought. And my conclusion, John, was for both business and journalistic reasons, somebody like Suzanne Scott, who may be a very nice person, I've never met her. She may give money to charity. She may like puppies, but she, she's bad as a news executive. She should not be running a news operation because either she doesn't understand news or worse, she understands it and doesn't care 
about what it's supposed to be. And I said, Rupert Murdoch should have done what he should do, what he should have done a long time ago. He should fire her. And then I concluded, too bad there's nobody to fire Rupert Murdoch. But yeah, yeah. Did you say, I remember everything. Oh, go ahead. everything. He could have, he could have said, I'm, I'm watching Fox. You're putting out stuff that's, that's not true. Stop it. He didn't do that. No, that's true. And I, I remember at the time when um, Tucker Carlson was was let go, um, I, you know, I remember a lot of people saying, you know, this is just the the beginning. There's going to be a lot of big, you know, ch change up. Executives are going to uh, go to. I don't, I can't think of anybody else who who left after that. I think that was it. I don't think any executives, from what I, do you do you recall any seeing any no, news items on that? There's a rule in corporate America, probably an unwritten rule that if you've got legal cases pending, you don't fire somebody who's responsible for the mess that they got you into because that in its own way admits guilt. So after Fox finishes with the other voting system, the, the $2.7 billion lawsuit, after Fox finishes with the guy who says he was defamed by Tucker Carlson as being a spy on January 6th, after Fox finishes with the lawsuits filed by shareholders. I don't know if Suzanne Scott's going to be around at that point, but who knows? Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so the last topic, um, it seems like we are seeing more and more stories of crime and looting in big cities, you know, whether it's San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, or other places. And what's remarkable, uh, I think, and you brought this up or suggested this, is how tolerant, um, you know, lawmakers, law enforcement agencies, and even private businesses, who are often the ones who are being victimized by these people, um, how tolerant they are of what's been happening. You know, brazen theft seems to have become normalized in some areas of the country. Um, Bernie, what do you think that says about uh, American society and where we're headed? I think this is a very big story. It's not about simply people stealing stuff from a drugstore. If you're allowed to go into a drugstore with a garbage can, not just a garbage bag, but a garbage can, and load everything on the shelves into it, and, and have no fear that a cop's going to come in and arrest you, or that a store security guard is going to do something to you, and then you casually walk out with this garbage can. If you could go into high-end stores and loot expensive merchandise. And if if the store employee so much as yells at you, just yells it, they'll get fired, as, as happened at a store in Atlanta, high-end store in Atlanta. The reason I think this is so important is because this is about our very existence as a civilization. If this, why won't, why is this gonna stop with looting drugstores and high-end businesses? Why aren't people going to say, yeah, I can get away with that, so I'm not going to pay uh, my parking tickets. I'm not going to, I'll go through red lights. It's a breakdown. I'm going to sound dramatic now, but I really believe this. Whether I'm right or wrong, people can tell me, but I really believe that this can lead to the breakdown of civilization. I know that sounds over the top, but I mean it. I did a piece once at CBS about people going through red lights and spoke to somebody who said, this is how civilizations fall, because it's a little crime that gives permission to people to commit other crimes. And I think that's what we're seeing with the looting. You're gonna see more of it. Criminals may have no morals, but they're not dopes. They know they can get away with it. And if they can get away with it, they're gonna do it. And more people are gonna do it. And even honest people who aren't gonna loot a store will cheat and steal in some other area. I think this is really an important big story that isn't being given the attention it deserves. No, I think you may be right. There's, you know, I think a lot of, and I'm one of these people who I think for a long time saw this as mainly like a regional problem. You know, I know, I remember a few years ago, my wife and I uh, vacation for a few days in Seattle. This is a while ago. It was before the pandemic. It was, you know, I, I don't remember the exact year, but it was, it was probably in the last six or seven years. And uh, yeah, we were just, you know, in the Seattle area. We actually had a really good time. We loved a lot, much, much of what we did there.
but I remember going into a drugstore and just watching this guy go in there, grab a bunch of stuff off the shelf, turn around and walk out. And I think, you know, some other customer said something to a security guy who wasn't really paying attention. He was on his phone or something. He was like, kind of just let the whole thing go. And to me, that was, that was, it felt like a regional thing. Cause I don't see that here where I live in Colorado. I know there's, if I was living maybe in Denver, I'd see a little bit more of it, but yeah, I think, um, do you think that's, do you see that as something that's going to be uh, spread out more into places? Well, that I, I think, I think reasonable, decent people who see what you saw are going to say, and why am I taking out my wallet and paying for what I'm buying here? That's right. This doesn't make sense. I got to pay $10 for this stuff that I'm buying. And he just took a thousand dollars worth of stuff and walked out. That's dangerous yeah. because yeah, then, then decent law abiding people start to think in different ways, not good, different ways. I don't think, I think this is as bad as it is. I think this can get a lot worse. And I'm, I'm all for it. Let me, I, I'm not a right wing Neanderthal, but I'm going to sound like one and I don't care. I'm for a crackdown, a big time crackdown on these people. Cops coming in, arresting them, judges, prosecutors, charging them, judges and juries, putting them away, putting them away. In San Francisco, there's a nice prison right across the bay. It's called San Quentin. Throw them in and throw them in for more than a week or a month or even a year. They're stealing stuff. And by the way, in California, there's a proposition that says you can steal up to $960, I think it is worth of stuff, and it's a misdemeanor. But what the hell is that about? And this is passed by the people. This was a proposition passed by the, the voters of, of California. You know, here's my final word. You voted for it. You voted for these prosecutors in Chicago. You voted for a progressive mayor who doesn't want to call mo thugs, thugs or mobs of people mobs. Good. You're entitled to vote for whoever you want. Live with the consequences of what you've done. California is with their proposition, turning everything into a misdemeanor, almost everything. And Chicago is paying for it. I just don't want it to come to a community near me or you. And that's the real danger. Why would it stop on the south side of Chicago or in Seattle or Portland? It's going to spread. Criminals, criminals know what's going on. They know they, they can get away with it. And that's why they're called criminals. They, 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 they're criminals. They'll do criminal things. And there are there are good <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> there are good templates out there for how to do this right. I mean, you look back in in New York years ago with Rudy Giuliani back before he was insane. Um, he did some really good things that really turned that city around. So it can be done. Um, you know, in the in the case of New York City, um, people took uh, a chance and voted for a Republican mayor uh, Giuliani, and I you know even even Bloomberg sort of held on to what Giuliani was doing to some extent. So it's it, there's a there are there are models out there for how to do this right you know good proofs of concept that show this is what we did this is how things changed and you're right I mean it's they keep a lot of these voters in these liberal cities they just keep voting for these same people that are that are light on this stuff and uh, you know it's not it's you know, not change. just looting it's not just looting it's also the homelessness thing do you know and I I've got this right even though it's going to sound like this can't be the Ninth Circuit Court based in San Francisco, which is a very liberal judicial court, said that you can't move homeless people off of the streets because that's a violation of their constitutional protection against cruel and unusual. I know the, the, the court said it's cruel and unusual to take people off the streets. What? This is what I'm saying that the whole fabric of our civilization is falling apart. Homeless people have more rights than the than the stores and the houses that they camp in camp in front of. Really?
Does that make any sense at all? A, a store owner can't do business because a homeless person is using the front of his store as a bathroom and, and courts protect that somehow? I'm sure the Ninth Circuit would say, no, we're not protecting somebody urinating on the street in front of a store. But if the, if the city can't force them into houses off the street, and can't force them into rehab because a lot of them are, are drug addicts. Then, then the, the the thread, you know, when you pull a thread on a sweater, you 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 could undo the whole sweater. Well, the United States of America is that sweater, and we're pulling on the thread. We better watch out. Well, on on that happy note, um, let's go let's go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I want to thank you again, Bernie, for 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 joining us here, and I want to thank for all the I want to thank all the members, of course, for tuning in. Um, please, everyone watching this, uh, let your friends know about what we're doing here. Uh, let us know what topics you'd like us to talk about. Leave your comments in the comments section. Uh, Bernie, is there anything else you'd like to add? Sorry if I depressed you. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. No worries. No worries. All right. Thanks, everybody, and you have a great day, Bernie.